Okay, we're in Daniel chapter 11, and I put this map up just to remind you that this chapter is about the days of the tribulation, the future when God's going to judge the world, but the way he judges it, he lets the Antichrist free to do what he wants done. And we're, we're reading about two things. Uh, in verses um, like 31 through 35, there, he goes after the believing remnant of Israel and begins persecution. And we didn't quite end, finish talking about that last week. In verses 36 through at least 39, it's now going to talk about what the Antichrist is going to do in the middle of the seven years of tribulation. The tribulation seven years long. I put the map on the board just so that you realize that all this is a battle between the king of the north. Now this has Syria. I probably wouldn't want that map. Yeah, that's not a good one. Anyhow, that, I like that one because anything north of the nation of Israel, so that the king of the north is north of Israel, and the king of the south is south of Israel, and the king of the south is Egypt. The Bible declares that. So uh, but anyhow, there's like eight conflicts where they battle back and forth. And uh, we're in the sixth uh, conflict as we talk about this persecution. Everything centers around verse 31 of Daniel chapter 11, and it says, And the arms shall stand on his part. Now this is the invasion of the king of the north, the man we call the Antichrist. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall uh, place the abomination that maketh desolate. And that phrase, the abomination that maketh desolate, that's when the Antichrist sets up an image in Israel's temple, claiming he is God, and for all the world to bow down and worship that image, and, if they, and to make sure that they do, he's going to require them to take the mark of the beast, the number 666. If you take the mark, then you have uh, access to your money, and if you don't take the mark, then you don't have access, you can't buy or sell. And uh, so that's what is happening in verse 31, and that takes place, according to Daniel chapter 9, right in the middle of the tribulation. Now, picking up from there, what I, what I want to point out to you, and I pointed it out last week, is that within the nation of Israel, there's two, kind of, two groups of people. If you know anything about the Jewish religion today, Judaism, that, that they have rejected Jesus Christ as being their Messiah. They don't, they don't recognize him. They, sometimes they'll actually talk about him being a good prophet, but really you'd have to say if he claimed to be God and, and the Messiah, he can't be good. <laughs> that they don't know how to deal with Christians on that. So some say he's a good, other, others just would have to admit that he was a false prophet or think that, say that he's a false prophet. But they have rejected the Messiah, so they're still waiting for the Messiah. So when Antichrist shows up, they're going to believe he is the Messiah and he's going to do some things that would reflect uh, and, and actually oppose at the same time uh, what the Messiah, the true Messiah did do. But the point is, is when he comes in, the Jews who have rejected Jesus Christ are going to receive him. They're going to be on his side. The Jews who have come to realize Jesus is the Christ, they're going to be the ones that uh, know the truth. And, uh, and so there's going to be that division in the nation of Israel. So in verse 32 it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant, that is God's covenant with Israel, shall, shall uh, he corrupt by flatteries. So he's in the nation of Israel now, he's in that temple, and those that, do, that work against God's covenant, he, the Antichrist, is going to corrupt by flatteries. He's going to say the things they want to hear. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They're going to do heroic acts. So you got the believing remnant and the unbelieving part of the nation of Israel, and that's what verse 33 through 35 is about. So with that it says, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. And I failed to point out the verse, we did read it, but I forgot to hit that point. In Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and then there's a parenthesis in that verse, whosoever readeth, let him understand. When they see that abomination, they should go, uh-oh, bow down to an image? That's against the law of God. And, and it should wake them up. And so he that reads and about the abomination, let him understand. And now we're reading about those who understand. Those who realize this man who stood up and put that image of himself, he's the Antichrist. 
So they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. And we talked about how they're going to either be executed, they're going to be burned at the stake, <laughs> they're going to be thrown in jail, captivity, or spoiled. They're, they're going to be take all their money and stuff, they're going to be taken away. They're not going to take the mark of the beast. Verse 34 says, Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And that's the point we're at in our study. Notice that there's this, the, believing, the unbelieving Jews and the believing Jews, but now there's some unbelieving Jews that are cleaving to them with flatteries. They're actually joining the believing remnant, saying, oh, I'm a believer, but they're not really a believer. Uh, they're, they're infiltrating, and that, that's our point of our study today. So I'll read verse 35, and then we'll look at some other verses. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white, even to the time of the end, uh, because it is yet for a, a time appointed. The Lord, had, they're on God's timetable here. And at the end of those seven years, Jesus Christ is going to return. But the Lord's going to allow them to persecute the believing remnant. And, and he's going to do that in verse 35 to try them. That is, that Somebody who says that, oh, I'm part of you. Well, when there says, okay, uh, we're going to chop your head off because you didn't take the mark of the beast. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, I really don't believe. <laughs> You're going to find out who the true believer is and who's not by the trial that they're going to go through. The true believer will be willing to die. And the unbelievers won't be willing to die. Now, to point that out, and we're going to look at other verses right now. So come over to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, the first uh, four, three chapters of the book of Revelation, is God writing, interestingly, to the churches of Asia, and that is the, the, the Jewish believers in Asia, which, by the way, is Turkey today. You might find that interesting next week. Anyhow, verse 9 says, chapter 3, verse 9, Behold, I make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. See, there's that, the, the ones that are entering in by flattery, and are not, but, but lie. Behold, I make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. That's the true believers. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell on the earth. And I want you to catch, focus in on the fact that there's this hour of temptation that's come to try them. And this is what we're reading about, how the, 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 the believing remnant, when, when they're tried, they'll go ahead and be martyred rather than deny the fact that Jesus is the Christ. The unbelievers, they will deny, and so the trial of faith is the abomination of desolation that God is going to allow the Antichrist to do. And remember, they're going to have lying signs and wonders. They're going to do miracles and really convince people that he is the Christ. And uh, so it's it, only those of understanding, those who have read the word of God and believe the Bible, are going to be able to withstand that trial of faith. But in that trial of faith, there's some things I want you to understand. First of all, uh, come to Isaiah chapter 60. Well, yeah. Come to Isaiah chapter 66. And Isaiah is an interesting book. There's 66 books in the Bible. The last book of the Bible ends with the book of Revelation. The last chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66, is all about what's going to happen at the end time. So it's quite interesting. But there's just well, a phrase in here, a statement in here that I want you to understand. In Isaiah chapter 66, and then in verse 5, it says, hear the, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hate you and cast you out for my name's sake said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. So you see the two different groups in there again. A voice of noise from the city, a voice of the, of the temple, a voice of the Lord that re rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. 
before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Now this is talking about the nation of Israel and the very fact that Israel, the believing remnant, had to be born again. But what's interesting in verse 7, it says, before she travailed. Travail, the tribulation is always explained as a travail upon a woman with child, like she's going into labor. That's how extreme the, the tribulation is going to be. And, but this says, before she travailed, the nation of Israel travailed, before they went through this tribulation, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. I'll explain that in a moment, but then watch it switch. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Well, now, all of a sudden, it's as soon as the tribulation started, she brought forth her children. One verse is before, and the other, as soon as the, the, the travail began, she brought forth her child. Verse 9 says, Shall I bring, bring to birth, and not cause to bring, bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth, uh, and, and shut the womb, saith God? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye people, and so forth. What I want to point out, Two things. First, there's this, Israel's going to bring forth her children before the tribulation. That is Acts chapter 2. That's when you start reading in the book of Acts before the Apostle Paul, before the interruption of the age of grace, that before the tribulation began, the, the believing remnant of Israel was born again. The believing remnant's there. But then, they're going to go through a tribulation, and as soon as they start going through that tribulation, they're going to, Israel's going to bring forth again. And when she brings forth again, the statement is, shall a nation be born at once? It, it, it says, uh, shall the earth be made to bring forth, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed. And my point to you is, when that trial of faith comes, if you're a Jew of any kind of, you know, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, but all of a sudden this man who you think is the Christ puts up an image and says, bow down and worship my image. Bells ought to go off, especially because that's why God judged Israel in the Old Testament for bowing down to graven images. And as soon as that man says that, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to wake up all at once. And a nation is going to be born in a day. The believing remnant is going to be born again right at that point. I'm not sure many people get saved, if any get saved, after the middle of the tribulation. Because that's a trial of faith right there. And a nation is going to be born at once. As soon as that travail begins, as soon as you're going, to, or you're going to be persecuted, if you don't bow down and worship this image, people are going to wake up. And there's going to be more people of understanding. So those people who have understanding are going to convince many. And, and that's what we're reading about when we read it in the book of Daniel. Now, there's another thing that I want to point out to you about this. And that is, when you read in your Bible, you've got the book of Acts... And, and then it comes, all of a sudden, Acts chapter 9, you've got the Apostle Paul being saved, the Apostle to the Gentiles. God interrupted his dealings with Israel. Today, God's not dealing with Israel. Here we are, a bunch of Gentiles, meeting, studying the Bible, knowing what God's going to do in the future. But before God does that in the future, God promises us we're going to be raptured out, and then the tribulation is going to begin. In the middle of that tribulation is going to be that abomination that's set up. When you read your Bible, it's laid out that way. You have the book of Acts, and in the first part of the book of Acts, you've got Israel coming to a faith, the believing remnant. But then in Acts chapter 9, you've got the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who's Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. And, and, and the next book in your Bible is the book of Romans. Romans is written to Roman, <laughs> to Gentiles, obviously. You've got Romans to Philemon, written by the apostle Paul, and that's, our, that's God's word, what God's accomplishing today in the age of grace. Soon as Paul's epistles are over, the next book of your Bible is called the book of Hebrews. Why is it, writ why is it called Hebrews? Because it's written to the Hebrews. But also I want you to understand, it's written to them concerning the new and living way to come to God. The book of Hebrews is written, don't come to God through the temple worship anymore. Don't come to God through animal sacrifices. Come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the full payment for your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's going to be a group in Israel that's going to try to bring back the animal sacrifices. We've talked about all this. They want to rebuild the temple. That, that's, that's their plans even to this day. 
after the age of grace is over, that's going to happen. They're going to build the temple, they're going to offer animal sacrifices, and then the Antichrist is going to set up that abomination. Hebrews is already warning them that was old. There's something, there's a new way to come to God. It's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the book of Hebrews, warning against the things that Israel is going to fall for if they don't come to understanding. But come to the next book after Hebrews. Come to the book of James, chapter 1. Because now you'll understand what Hebrews through Revelation is about. It's picking up in the future time where they're going to be facing the tribulation and this abomination. So the book after Hebrews is James. Look at chapter 1, if I get there. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greetings. Now you're not one of the twelve tribes of Israel. <laughs> you're a Gentile. So this book is not written to you. And it's not written about the age of grace either. Watch. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Oh, wow. You're going you're to go through a trial of faith. Be patient. Jesus Christ will come back and set up the kingdom in three and a half years. That's how the prophecy will be fulfilled. So you see who it's written to and what it's talking about. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you realize what the book of James is all about. A lot of people confuse the Apostle Paul with the book of James and get in all kinds of trouble and false doctrine because of that. But all you got to do is realize when you come to Hebrews through Revelation, you're now reading about what God's going to do in the future with the nation of Israel and what they need to know to go through that tribulation. So the book after James is 1 Peter. Come over to 1 Peter, the next book over, just a couple pages. Another interesting thing to keep in memory for next week, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to strangers, now that, that means foreigners, scattered abroad throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now that, when it talks about strangers, people who live in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, they're not strangers. That's their homeland. The strangers that are there are the Jews that got scattered in the book of Acts. That's where they got scattered to. And now Peter's writing to the Jews that are scattered in that area. And by the way, if you would look in a Bible map, see that Turkey? Every one of those areas are in that area called Turkey. Interesting. But that's not our study either. Look over in verse 6. Uh, well, verse 4 says so, uh, that the. Verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. They're talking about, okay, the salvation that's going to come at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. <laughs> They're going to go through a bunch of te testings. Oh, verse 7 that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, ye not, in whom uh, though n now ye see, not, see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your salvation, even the salvation of your souls." So here are some people that's going to go through a trial of faith waiting for Jesus Christ to come back and bring their salvation. That's when the Bible says all Israel will be saved and Israel be, being the believing remnant that the Lord loves. So you got Hebrews through Revelation is talking about this trial of faith. The very thing that we're studying more than 600 years before the Lord ever came, Daniel already talked about all these things. And that's what we're studying. But we see that there, there's two groups within the nation of Israel, and the one is going to persecute the other. And, and so there's this group that's being persecuted. But our study today, actually, remember, they're going to, come, they're going to join the believing remnant with flatteries. They're not just two separate groups that are obvious. The group who doesn't believe is going to join with the group that does believe. Now, part of that is to infiltrate and to tell on them. 
here's a group of people hid over here, they don't have the mark of the beast, and, but, but the other is they're just kind of clinging to him. You might remember Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, the, that they, they said they were part of the group, but they're really holding back. Anyhow, I want to point out to you what you read in 1 John. Come to 1 John chapter 2. That's after 1 and 2 Peter, then you come to 1 John. You can see how all this is all about the last days. They're not our doctrine about the age of grace. They're about the wrath of God. In 1 John chapter 2, by the way, chapter 1 is, is to, written to the unbelieving Jews, calling them to repentance, to believe. Chapter 2, he starts addressing writing to the believers. But really the theme of 1 John is how do you tell a true believer from a non-believer? And the reason you need 1 John is because they're going to be infiltrated. You're not going to know. So we pick up in verse 18 of 1 John chapter 2. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby ye know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction of the Holy One, and you know all things." So you realize the ones who are leaving the believing remnant, John is saying they never were part of us. Because one of the things when he says you have an unction of the Holy One, what the Holy Spirit is going to do in the believing remnant, he's going to make sure that they stand strong. They're not going to do this in their own might. That he's going to empower them to stand up against and even be willing to be martyred. But the ones who don't have the Holy Spirit, the ones who aren't saved, they are going to depart. And when they depart, John says, hey, they were never of us. If they were of us, they would have continued. Because the new covenant to the nation of Israel is God's going to cause the believing remnant to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. He's going to empower them to do it. So would you pick up again, we'll drop down some chap uh, verses here. Go down to verse 25. It says, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. Well, that's the new covenant. But, uh, uh, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is true and is no lie, even as it taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when uh, he shall appear, we shall have confidence uh, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. See, the Holy Spirit's going to keep the believing remnant from, from falling away. They'll, they'll, they'll be willing to even die for Christ. Come over to chapter 5. It says, uh, verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. See, they're going to know the difference between Jesus and the Antichrist. See, there's two Christs, but only there's one Jesus Christ. <laughs> the one who already came. And uh, in fact, when you just read on, it says, verse 5, it says, Who is he? Uh, uh, verse 6, and this is he that came by water and blood. That's the first birth, the physical, and then he shed his blood. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear witness in, in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the point is, is that... Uh, identifying who Jesus Christ is and that he came in the flesh and he's coming back again the second time. So uh, you, you see the, the importance of, of uh, Hebrews through Revelation concerning the things that we're studying. I remind you, we won't turn there, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, the Lord, when he comes back, he, there's going to be a lot of people that say, 
uh, Lord, haven't we done miracles in your name, cast out devils and so forth? And he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. And that's going to be some of those people at the end who made it all the way through the tribulation, think they're going to join the kingdom, and the Lord's going to say, nah, you're one of those that joined by flattery. You were never saved. I never knew you. Didn't know you as one of my people. So that, that's the warning there. Now go back to Daniel 11. We're not going to get too far here, but I'm going to even have to interrupt next week to teach you that other thing that came to my attention that I think you'll appreciate. So we pick up in verse 36. Now here, we, we've learned about the believing remnant. Now here is what the Antichrist is going to be doing. It's going to focus in on him. Verse 36, and, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, so that, uh, uh, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, the true god, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that determined shall be done. The Lord said all this is going to take place, <laughs> and it's going to be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor des the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, we're, we're getting some idea of the identity of the Antichrist. I just say it now because I won't say it again later, where it says, nor desire, uh, desire, nor the desire of women. This Antichrist isn't going to, you know, in modern days, you wonder if he's not going to be a homosexual, you know? <laughs> you can't help but think that. <laughs> but it just might be that he just, that's, that's not something that tempts him. Uh, especially if he is going to be an antichrist, Jesus Christ, he never got married. He never, you know, had temptations toward a woman. So this guy is claiming to be Jesus Christ or the Christ, so it might fit into his counterfeit action. But the first part of that, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. The question is, who are his fathers? And that kind of gives us some clue to look at, and I don't think we're going to get too far on that. Uh, but anyhow, verse 38 goes on to say, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So he doesn't honor the God of his fathers, but he's got a different God, a God of forces that he honors. And, and when he honors, he's going to honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. This shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them that rule over men, cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Now, you know, ever since we started this chapter, I kept telling you there's this he and they and them that's hard to figure out. Uh, this week, when you're reading through this chapter, who in the world's the them at the end of verse 39? We're talking about this Antichrist. He shall cause them to rule over many. Who's the them? We never, we're not interested, uh, introduced to that them. That I can't find, I can't go back in the passage to find out who, the, who he's talking about. I have a good idea who they're talking about, but I'll have to cover that when we actually get that down to that part of the verse. But the point is, he's, he's honoring God with a strange God, so, or with a strange God. So I want to make two things before we close in Sunday school. First of all, we're not going to go back to these verses. We've already been studying verse by verse all the way through the book of Daniel. But here when it talks about in verse 36, he shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. And he speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Okay? So when you learn about him, what, he, what he's going to do, we already read in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10 that he defies the armies of heaven. That's interesting. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, he blasphemes God. Uh, I'm going to read to you Revelation chapter 13 verse 6 just because it... We've read it several times. It'll be a reminder to some of you, but it says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in them. 
So that's the beast of Revelation, the, the one we call the Antichrist. He's going to be blaspheming, speaking against the true God. And he's just openly going to be blaspheming God. Then the other thing he does in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11, it says he magnifies himself. You know, you put a magnifying, you make something bigger. Even if this is a man and dwelt by Satan, he's trying to make himself bigger. What's bigger? God. <laughs> he's declaring himself to be God. So he magnifies himself. And then as you, as you read here in, in uh, uh, well, no, first, first Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 where Paul talks about him, it says he exalts himself above all that is called God. So, but here, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, what it says about him, he's going to do according to his will. Now, the reason I repeat all those things to you, he's an antichrist, but he's nothing like the Lord Jesus Christ. When you study about the Lord Jesus Christ, he is not self-willed. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to do his will. He came to do the will of God the Father. And so you can see the difference in them. So in contrast to him and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ did not speak of himself. The Bible, when he, in Daniel chapter, uh, John chapter 5, he said, the Father gave testimony of me, and then he quotes the scriptures, the Spirit gives testimony of him, the miracles that he did give testimony, but he didn't brag about himself. He let God the Father and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit through miracles declare who he is. He didn't magnify himself, but this guy magnifies himself uh, so, that, so that he's different than the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so he, the Lord Jesus Christ, in contrast, he did not speak of himself, he did not magnify himself, and he didn't do according to his will. All the things that this Antichrist is doing, the Lord Jesus Christ did not do. And uh, so we see that that even though he's an antichrist, he cannot fulfill, even look like the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that he acts. And, and at the point in time, it's all going to end. So that now that takes us to where it says in verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. The question always comes up in talking about the antichrist, is he going to be a Jew? And if he's going to be a Jew, how is it that he not going to regard the God of his fathers. He's not going to regard Jehovah God. Who does he regard? Well, the, in Revelation 13, the dragon, Satan, gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. He's actually, when he's, he's not going to talk about Jehovah God, he's going to talk about another God, which is actually Satan himself. That's the God that he's going to magnify. But when it says the God of his fathers, is he a Jew that's an apostate that's worshiping Satan and causing the world to bow down to Satan? And uh, there's some verses that will give us some clues about that. The map is up there to help you with those clues, but we don't have time to go through that. <laughs> I will tell you this, that it's interesting that it could be a half-breed in the sense that the first tribe to go astray in the nation of Israel is the tribe of Dan. And even next week or the week after, we're not going to study about Dan. But when God divided their, their territory, Dan had a place right near outside of Jerusalem. But there, it was so small that they sent out armies. And on the, on the way, they got an apostate priest and everything. And then finally conquered land north of Israel and set up their tribe north of the nation of Israel. And we're talking about a king of the north. And, uh, and could he be associated with the tribe of Dan, where he is like a half-breed Jew, coming out of the north, associated with Dan, and, and, uh, and then somehow accepted in the nation of Israel as the Messiah? And that's about all I can put together, but I'll show it to you with verses in two weeks. Next week, you want to be here for that. I'm going to close there for today. There's some, I just got to stop. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. Father, we thank you that we can study things that are still future to our day and begin to understand some events that are going to take place. And certainly, when it all takes place, those who have read your word and believed it, they are going to be those that have understanding, and they're going to try to convince many, uh, but die in the process. We thank you for the freedom that we have in our country today to be able to teach these things. And we pray for the next hour as well that we might add to our understanding of Scripture. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.